Okay, so as you know, we're in the book of Nahum. Uh, Nahum is really about the justice of God. Today we're going to be going over historical context. So last week we just went into a quick introduction as to who wrote it, why he was writing it, who he was writing it to, that type of stuff. Today we're going to go through the historical context of Israel, Judah, and Assyria so that we know what what is going on at that point in time. So last week we went through who wrote the book, Nahum, who did he write it to? He wrote it to his countrymen, the Israelites, about Nineveh and Assyria. It was written approximately 654 B.C. It's a prophetic book, uh, but it's laced with poetry, so we're going to hopefully dive into that at a certain point. The theme or purpose of the book is the justice of God. We're going to see God's justice on full display here. And finally, the historical context text, which is what we're going to get into today. So, I told you last week, the historical background for Nahum is 2 Kings 17 through, through 23, and 2 Chronicles 33 and 34, and Isaiah 36 through 39. We're going to read two long passages out of uh, that today. Nahum is prophesying while Assyria is still at the height of her power. Assyria is well known among the agents as being a cruel, barbaric savage nation that would demolish their enemies. Um, during, which, during the whole period in which Naaman prophesied, the kings of Judah, Manasseh, and Josiah were vassals of Assyria. And a vassal state is basically a state that pays tribute, uh, mob money, to the larger country in order so as not to be destroyed, to keep them at bay. So real quick, I want to give you just a, a quick overview, Okay. The green part over there is the northern tribes of Israel. Below that, the orange part is Judah and Benjamin. Those are the southern tribes. Up here, these are the prophets that spoke to the northern tribes of Israel. You have Jonah, which we went through several, probably over a year ago, Amos and Hosea. They were prophesying to the northern tribes of Israel. All of these prophets were prophesying to the southern tribes of Israel. We're here, Nahum. Now, Nahum comes after Micah, which we just went through. Brother Lawrence went through that. And Jonah was before that. So here you see the, the, the progression. We're at this point in history where Assyria has taken over the northern tribes. Okay. Now, this caused, this was a split in Israel before Assyria took them over. You had Rehoboam and Jeroboam, sons of Solomon, who disputed with one another. The northern tribes set up, if you see here in Bethel, they set up a, a separate sanctuary there. They were, they were doing worship and animal sacrifices when it was supposed to be done in Jerusalem. So they basically separated, and this caused a rift between northern Israel and southern Israel. In fact, when you're reading through the, the Gospels and you hear about the Samaritans, Samaria, right there, see Samaria, okay? Those are known as the Samaritans. And that's why the, the Jews in the, in the gospel had such animus towards the Samaritans. Because they were, they, were, they were worshiping God falsely in a temple that was not set up the way it was supposed to be. So, so the Samaritans are not some foreign people. They're actually Jews that were intermingled with the Assyrians when they come in. They married in. Okay, So that will give you some context on the Samaritans. So here we are, Nahum. This, this dark green area, this is Assyria, okay? In 150 years, they took over the land, all the light green. What's really important to know is, and we're going to see this in a second, Nineveh is up there. That's the capital of Assyria, okay? Judah is down here, and then you have this little country known as Syria, now, a lot of people get mixed up between Assyria and Syria. Syria is the smaller nation, okay, that's not Assyria. Assyria is the big nation, okay, the cruel, barbaric nation. Took over Syria and took over Israel. Now, one of the big things to realize is actually, uh, uh, as the capital of Nineveh, the Assyrians were located there and started expanding outward. They had their eyes on Egypt, very important. The only way from Nineveh to Egypt is through what? Territory of Judah. So Judah had to make sure that they were protected, 
Okay, and the Assyrians knew Judah was a focal point. If we caught Judah, the rest of Egypt is going to follow. So for a little while, they went around. They went around Judah, but then eventually they're like, we want Judah. And that's what we're going to get into today. Judah is the, sur is the surviving tribes of Israel, composed of Judah and Benjamin. Okay, so Nahum is prophesying to Judah about the Assyrians. That's why this is about the justice of God. The Assyrians were a bloodthirsty, cruel people. Okay? All right, let's move. Jonah was called, we're going to start at Jonah, because that's where this started. Remember, Nahum is Jonah 2.0. Right? Nahum is the second half of the story. And that's what we're going to get to. So we're going to start with Jonah and just go through the context biblically and then historically. So Jonah was called to preach to the Ninevites. Okay, as you know, jo Jonah was a prophet of God. He pe preached re repentance to the Ninevites around 740 B.C. Nineveh, that great city, says it over and over and over again, kind of like poking Judah in the eye, uh, Jonah in the eye. Great city. These are a bloodthirsty people. So God calls Jonah to preach repentance. What does Jonah do? He takes a hard left and goes the other way. It's like, uh-uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not going there. He didn't want to go to the Ninevites because they were brutal, bloodthirsty people. And Jonah knew that God could actually use the Assyrians to um, cause Israel a problem. He knows that there's a prophecy in Deuteronomy 31, 32. They, Israel, have made me, a jeal made me jealous with what is no God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are no people, Assyria. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Now, Jonah knows Assyria, knows their reputation. And he's like, please, Lord, anyone but Assyria. I don't want them to make us look foolish. But that's exactly what God is going to do. This is why Jonah runs the other way. He doesn't want Assyria to repent and be used by God to bring uh, Israel into, into favor again. Okay? So, Assyria is that foolish nation, right? Nineveh is the capital of Assyria, but how did Nineveh get its start? Who started it? Anybody know who, how uh, uh, Assyria came to be? Because this is important too. Yes? It was Nimrod. Excellent. Good job, Callista. Right? And it comes through the sons of Ham. So, real quick, I just want to read this. Genesis 10, the sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, Canaan, the sons of Cush, Seba, Halava, Havilah, Sabbath, Rama, Sabteca, the sons of Rama, Sheba, Dedan, Cush fathered Nimrod. There's our guy. He was the first on the earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. First, the, he, he, he started a city in Babel where we get the Tower of Babel from. Erech, Akkad, Kalna, in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went into Assyria and built Nineveh. Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, Rezin, between Nineveh and Kala, that is the great city. Egypt fathered Ludim, Anamin, Lahebin, Naphtuhim, Pathurusim, Kalushim, from whom the Philistines came, and Kephortim. Okay? So, there's a very, very important theological point. I know, I, did, I messed up all those names. You don't have to remind. I know. I, I, I get it. I get it. You all look at me like... All right, there's a very important theological point to be made of this passage. You realize all of Israel's enemies came from the line of Ham. All from the line of Ham. This is why, do you realize, this is why God banned pork in the Old Covenant. Now, I know that that's not true. Just, just to let you know that it's not true. But guess what? You're never going to forget that all the evil line came through Ham. All right? I know that it's not true. It's a bad joke. I'm known for that. All right? But the evil line came through Ham. So when you go through the story, you're going to recognize Ham is behind all this. All right? All right, here we go. All right. So as God's prophet, Jonah is aware of Nineveh and what's happening. But he wants nothing to do with the mission. He will not be made jealous by these savages. These are barbarians. So we know the story. Jonah tries to escape. He goes the other way. God laughs, hurls a storm at him, gets the sailors on the boat to repent. 
They throw Jonah overboard. God gets a fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah repents. And then what? Then he finally goes to Nineveh. Five steps into the nation, what happens? He preaches. He's five steps in. Forty more years and 40 more days, and uh, God's going to crush Nineveh. Boom! Everybody hits their knees. Everybody's repenting. Jonah's like, you got to be kidding me. Right? Could you imagine we go into Port Jeff and say, 40 more days, God's going to crush Port Jeff, and everybody hits the deck. Oh, we repent, Lord. We want to know you. Jonah's like, you, really? And obviously this is highlighting the sovereignty of God. Right? He calls us to, to preach that message, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand, and it's up to God to bring them to their knees. Our, our job is to bring, speak the message of truth, right? Be faithful to that. God's job is to convert the heart. Now, Jonah sees this. He's ticked off. Oh, gosh, really? Now, in fairness to Jonah, he knows that this message is going to bring about the Ninevites' repentance, which in contrast to his own country, Israel, <clears throat> Israel was in idolatry. Right? They were not acting faithful to the Lord. They were sacrificing to other gods. They were um, oppressing the poor. They were not acting according to God's word. This would be very bad for Israel because God will eventually use the Assyrians to sweep into idolatrous Israel and punish them for their sinfulness. So obviously Jonah's upset with that. Jonah's message reached the king of Nineveh. He got up off his throne, he removes his robe, he covered himself with sackcloth, sat in ashes, and he issued a proclamation and published it throughout Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. He calls for a, a public fast, even to the animals. The animals can't eat or drink. He's now submitted to the Lord. And we know that this was actual repentance because in Matthew and Luke, it says the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. All right. This is when we went through the book of Jonah. This is what would be known as the sign of Jonah. Jesus is going to die. He's going to be buried for three days and rise from the dead. The same way Jonah was swallowed by the fish, stuck in there three days and then comes out. What Jonah didn't know was that the Ninevites repenting gives Israel time to repent of their sin before God brings judgment. So this is really an act of grace for Israel. Okay, so the Assyrians are coming in. They, 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 they want to take over uh, the northern tribes of Israel. God gets them to repent. So now they're not as bloodthirsty. They say, okay, we're going to follow the Lord. That gives Israel some time. And as you know, miraculously and providentially, the Assyrians had a 40-year military pause. For 40 years, they stopped attacking people. 40. Hmm, where do we hear that number? Right? Over and over and over. 40 is a, a period of testing. So for 40 years, God gives grace to Israel in hopes that they would repent. Okay? To, in hopes that they would see their their condition before God, see that even the Ninevites repented, yet they wouldn't. Okay? So, they ceased from warring against their neighbors, Assyria ceased from warring against their neighbors, and gave uh, Israel opportunity to repent, 40 years. Israel would eventually fail the test, and Assyria would come in, invade, and wreak havoc on them. They would deport them, which means taking them out of their land and spreading them throughout all of Assyria. They would inbreed with them, which would dilute their, their genealogical line, their physical lineage. lineage. And you, you realize for Israelites, physical lineage is a big thing, right? That's why we get all the begets in, in the scriptures. Okay? They traced their physical line. They wanted to keep the, the nation of Israel pure. Their goal, the Assyrians' goal for Israel was for them to lose their identity, and it worked. The northern ten tribes would become later known as the lost tribes of Israel, right? You ever hear that term, the lost tribes of Israel? This, it was, this is where it comes from, because Assyria came in, diluted them to the point, dilute, not diluted as in mind, dilute as in, you know, mixing two things together and getting it to disperse. So they came in, they intermarried 
with the Israelites and diluted their bloodline and deported them throughout the whole land. Got it? Okay. So only Judah and Benjamin would be left. That was that lower orange piece of Israel. Only Judah and Benjamin would be left of all God's people to carry on the physical lineage. Assyria would eventually invade Judah, and it was before this invasion into Judah by Assyria that Micah, the prophet Micah, comes on the scene. So now Jonah's out of the picture. Now we have the prophet Micah, which Brother Lawrence went through. Micah prophesied to Israel and Judah during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, about 750 to 700 B.C., about the same time as Isaiah. So Isaiah is also preaching to, this, to the southern tribes as, as well as Micah. The northern kingdom, which was that green piece of Israel, actually fell to Assyria during Micah's ministry. Yes? Micah prophesying to both the north and the south. Yes, well, he was prophesying mostly to the south because they were the ones who were still not following. They were seeing what was happen to, happening to northern Israel, yet they were not repenting. They still were oppressing the poor. In fact, I think uh, Hosea calls um, the women the cows of Bashan, right? right? Okay, saying they, would, they were getting fat, dumb, and happy, and everybody, would, you know, it's uh, health, wealth, and prosperity, basically, and forget about everyone else. They were not concerned with truly following the Lord the way he's prescri prescribed. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. So the northern kingdom actually fell to Assyria during Micah's ministry in 722, and Judah almost fell in 701, and that's in 2 Kings 18 through 20. Micah contained three sections with which alternate between words of warning and messages of hope. Micah told of a day when there would be peace among all nations, who would then be able to beat their swords into plowshares, which we hear about in the New Testament, and of a royal deliverer who would save God's people from all her enemies, this deliverer would be born in Bethlehem. Any idea who that might be? Say it. Oh, just making sure. Joseph Smith. All right. No, Jesus. Jesus. All right. There we go. So the northern, northern Israel falls, and Judah is next in line. This is where the book of Nahum and Nahum the prophet come in. He comes in at six, around 640 A.D., after Micah, about 100 years after Micah, and about 150 years after Jonah, okay? So Nahum's focus was on the Assyrians. Again, he's the first of the last six minor prophets. So up to this point, we've, we've gone through um, Israel's history, right? Now we're going to focus a little bit more on uh, Assyria's history. And here I, I gleaned a lot from a theologian and a historian by the name of Bruce Gore. If you've if you've never listened to his stuff, tune in on YouTube or his podcast. He's got tremendous historical information. So I gleaned a lot of what I'm going to tell you now directly from him. So we'll get a better understanding of the book of Nahum if we understand the context of Assyria's history and Israel's history because they're related politically and spiritually. Okay, so let's go. I know I'm moving a little fast, but we got a lot of information to cover. So in about 744, the time of Micah, Assyria came back. Again, this is after the 40-year pause. Now Assyria, Assyria kind of went by the wayside. They forgot about their repentance. They forgot about the Lord and said, we're going to go back to our old ways. So they came back with a vengeance under Tiglath-Pileser and came sweeping through the land with a devastating force. Remember, they were brutal people. Remember that they repented at the time of Jonah when Jonah preached to them. He gave Israel a 40-year reprieve, which was grace and compassion by God, but now that faded away, and Assyria picked up where they left off. In 732, they conquer Syria. That was that little piece of, that little nation above Israel, okay, and, and below Assyria, okay? <clears throat> they come in and basically destroy Syria. It's completely taken over by the Assyrians. It's under Assyrian rule. Now, keep in mind that Syria and Assyria are two different nations. Syria is just that small country above. In 722, Assyria continues south and conquers Israel for good. Okay, now this we talked about just a few seconds ago. This is the, the timeline of Assyria. Okay, I gave you Israel's point of view. This is Assyria's point of view. That's why we're going through the, the dates. Assyria, Assyria continues south. 
conquers Israel, they're wiped out by the hand of God. And this is as per Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah used the Assyrian nation to come in and discipline his people. The Israelites are deported, scattered to the four winds, and become known as the lost tribes of Israel. Ten years later, Assyria marches further south on the way to Egypt. And on the way to Egypt is through Judah. And in 712, Egypt comes under Assyrian domain. Now remember, Judah is a vassal state. They're paying the, the, the king of Assyria money, so he leaves them alone for now. But he passes, they pass through, they conquer Egypt. Judah will come next, right? They got their, their, their sights set on Judah. Now part of the reason for this, okay, oh, I'm sorry, 10 years later, Egypt comes through, 712, Egypt comes under Assyria, Assyria's domain. What's really interesting is that Jerusalem and Judah dodge a bullet and escapes Assyria's march. Anyone know why? Aside from them paying tribute? Part of the reason for this is because, uh, because of Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, who's the uh, is Israelite king of Judah. He made a deal with Piglath Kaleza. He's, he's paying him off. It's mob money. Assyria was okay with that. They were being paid. And when Hezekiah assumed his father's throne, he continued the tribute. He continued paying the money. So Hezekiah keeps paying significant tribute each year to Assyria. That's how Jerusalem avoids destruction and stays out of Assyria's rampage. However, Hezekiah sees the writing on the wall. No pun intended. Right? <clears throat> this, this, this relationship between him and Assyria is not going to last for a, forever. The Assyrians are eventually going to come in and try to destroy them. When Assyria came back in 712, they went right around Jerusalem, engulfed, engulfed Egypt, and pushed back Pharaoh, who uh, was the Ethiopian king, back into Egypt. Hezekiah is now thinking to himself, I really don't think this relationship is going to continue this way. Right? It's not going to go on like this forever. I need a plan. So he began to recognize that he was at great risk with the Assyrians, and it actually, he actually came up with a plan to survive. He created what's called Hezekiah's Tunnel. You may have heard of that, which is actually still there today. It was built in 710, right? And 2 Kings 20.20 20 says, The rest of the deeds of Hezekiah and all his might and how he made the pool and the conduit and brought water into the city. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? So King Hezekiah knows there's, there's going to come a point in time when the Assyrians decide we're going to take Judah. He's planning in advance to have water to be able to come into the country so they can survive. So he's making future plans just to protect Judah from Assyria. Okay? Uh, Hezekiah was smartly anticipating that Jerusalem was going to be put under siege, and he wants to make sure they have a water supply. So that was part of the reason the tunnel was constructed. He continues paying tribute until 705. Now, in 705, the king that was reigning in Assyria is Sargon II. He died and was replaced by his then successor and son, Sennacherib. You probably heard of him. Now, the common thing that would happen in the ancient world at that time, when you had a regime change, a new king comes, comes into play, the, con the countries that were paying tribute would, would use that as a moment to create some instability. Right? There's a new king, or maybe we're not going to pay tribute. We're not sure. Many times, the, the vassal countries would revolt and stop paying the tribute. And that's what Hezekiah decided to do. So in 705, in the Old Testament, 2 Kings 18.7, it tells us that Hezekiah revolted against the king of Assyria and stopped paying tribute. Let's see. 2 Kings 18, he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. As the Lord was with him, whenever he went out, he prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. So he's, he's deciding at this point, we're not going to be a vassal state anymore. We're not going to pay him no more tribute. And this was a dangerous thing to do, <clears throat> but he did, did it probably in part because of what Isaiah told him. He was telling him that Assyria was not going to destroy Jerusalem. Nevertheless, it was still risky. So this is what Isaiah tells him. When the servants of King Hezekiah, is this right? Yeah, when the servants of King 
Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Say to your master, thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him, so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword of his own land. And it is that incident when Sennacherib's armies come to Judah, uh, to the surrounding wall of the Jerusalem, to the surrounding wall of the city, and they're like, we're going to pummel you, right? And then uh, the, 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 the Judeans say, hey, listen, don't, don't speak to us in Hebrew. Everybody else can understand you, right? And that's when Isaiah tells them, don't worry. Don't worry about these people. God's going to put a spirit into them and send them the other way. So about a year after this, King Hezekiah becomes ill, ill to the point of death. So as Hezekiah is sick, Isaiah the prophet comes to him and it bluntly tells him, get your house in order. You're going to die. Hezekiah gets the word that he's not going to survive or recover from this, right? And this is what 2 Kings says. In those days, Hezekiah became sick. It was at the point of death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said, thus says the Lord, set your house in order. For you shall die, you shall not recover. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Now, O Lord, please remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. <clears throat> so Hezekiah is upset. He, obviously, he knows he's going to die. In fact, he began to remind God that, hey, look, I was a pretty good king. You know, I wiped out some of the idolatry. I destroyed the high places. I've been pretty faithful. He tried to do everything that he was supposed to do to turn the people back to God, back to worship. He's basically pleading for his life. But I think there's more to the story. Anybody want to venture a guess as to why Hezekiah might also be crying, aside from wanting his life spared? Uh, is he not saved? That could possibly be true. What else? What? Go ahead. Right. So is it not true that he was told, in your life, everything is going to be fine in Judah, dot, 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 and in the middle of the room, well, that means when you die, Judah will also be overrun. Right. So what does Hezekiah not have? Whose line is Hezekiah in? Maybe that'll help. He's in King David's line. What does Hezekiah not have right now? He doesn't have a son. Right? If there's no son and Hezekiah dies without a son, son, then there will be no one to sit on the king on the throne, which, which would void God's promise that there would always be someone from the line of David seated on the throne. Hezekiah is weeping bitterly because he knows if he does not bring forth a son, God's promises to Israel are over and he's done. The whole nation of Israel would be gone. He is the family line of David, and the promise to David had been that David would have a son on the throne of Judah in Jerusalem. In other words, there would be a ruling family which would remain intact until the promised Messiah came, one who would eventually take the throne of David and rule forever. So without a son, there would eventually be no Messiah. That was the problem. Hezekiah knew he was part of this promise. He knew that he was in the lineage, and if he died without a son, it meant that God himself was abandoning these people. In other words, they were so wicked, so evil, that not even God was going to fill his, fulfill his covenant promise. Right? <clears throat> so God, think about it, showed incredible compassion to the Ninevites, who were bloodthirsty people. And, and Hezekiah is worried that he's not going to show the same compassion to Israel. Okay, so... That would mean that Judah, which is the, the, the nation that he's king over, would become what Israel had become. Scattered. Not my people. Not beloved. Therefore, he's weeping bitterly, not simply for his own, his own life, which would be understandable. He's weeping for the fate of his people, Israel. His, he's crying bitterly to God, please, Lord, don't you see I've tried to fix things here. Now, Hezekiah was brokenhearted for the sake of his people. He wept bitterly over that. Isaiah, <clears throat> who's there, didn't get out of the middle court of the palace before the word of the Lord came to Hezekiah a second time. And he says this, 
Before Isaiah had got out of, out of the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. Turn back and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you, uh, you and the city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend the city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant, David. So God now says, okay, I'm going to relent, and you will. You'll be extended 15 years. So Isaiah went back, said that to Hezekiah. And during those 15 years, God gives to Hezekiah a son who he, who he names Manasseh. Now, I was going to read this, but we're, we're not going to be able to with the amount of time. So this is 2 Kings 21, verses 1 through 17, if you want, you want to write that down. So he gives Hezekiah a son who, whom he names Manasseh. And Manasseh becomes one of the most wicked kings that Jerusalem ever saw. And this basically goes through, he did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking to him to anger, and the carved image, image of Asherah that he had made, he set in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. He goes on and on and on. There's a whole other page of it. And there we go. We're not going to read the whole thing. But uh, Manasseh is a wicked king. He is not good by any stretch of the imagination. So about a year or so later, 704, 703, a royal entourage arrives in Jerusalem and, uh, from another city that wasn't of no reputation. This time it's from Babylon. Okay. So Merodach Baladin visits Hezekiah and he knows now Babylon is a competing uh, nation against Assyria. He knows Judah is like a linchpin to the whole thing, right? So now Babylon is vying for, for Judah's, Judah's allegiance, okay? A man named Merodach Baladan, who is known in secular history, sees the throne. He usurped the throne, usurped the throne of Babylon. He's mentioned as, in Isaiah 39. He's looking for support as he wants a foothold against Assyria. Judah would be a nice piece of real estate to have. So he hears about Hezekiah having been ill and sends him lavish, expensive gifts, a bribe, right? A royal visit from uh, the dignitaries of Babylon. Um, he's maneuvering for an ally because he knows he's going to be dealing with Assyria soon, and he wants Jerusalem as a strategic point. Hezekiah, you'll, know, you'll rem be reminded of this story. You'll know it. He receives the, the, the entourage from Babylon and gives them an inside tour of the palace, Right? At that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of the king of Babylon, sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah welcomed them, and he showed them all the treasure of his house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the oil, his armory, and all that was found in the storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Right? That's not good. Isaiah is a little upset, and he says, you showed him everything. We don't need your money. We don't need all the riches that you have. You don't need to show that to them. So Isaiah says, behold, the days are coming when all this in your house and that which your fathers has stored up to this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing of it shall be left, uh, <clears throat> says the Lord. So he showed him all his riches, which was not a good thing because he's trying to impress the Babylonians. You don't need to impress the Babylonians. God is on your side, okay? God's going to vindicate himself without the help of Hezekiah. So Hezekiah eventually uh, dies in 686, and Manasseh takes over at 13 years old. Again, he's one of the worst kings in Israel. Now, this is not biblical, but this is church tradition. Tradition has it that Isaiah was martyred by King Manasseh, okay? He, Hezekiah's son Manasseh, again, evil king, he actually, according to tradition, Isaiah was tied in a sack, placed within the hollow of a tree trunk, and was sawed in two. The story traces back to a first century non-canonical book called The Ascension of Isaiah, which claims to tell the story of Isaiah's death. Even Tertullian, which is an early church father, and Justin Martyr, both mention the legend of Isaiah's death in their writings. Origin of Alexandria also upheld the tradition that Isaiah was cut in two by Manasseh. Remember Hebrews chapter 11? It states, some died by stoning, some were sawed in half 
Others were killed with the sword. According to some extra biblical sources, one of those unnamed persons that was sword in half was Isaiah the prophet by, Man by Manasseh the king. Okay. Now, that's extra biblical tradition. It may or may not be true, but it makes sense based on everything that we heard. Okay, moving right along. In 669, an Assyrian king named Ashurbanipal takes the throne. Okay, <clears throat> he reigns for a long while. He's a competent but very brutal king. He captures the essence of what Assyrian kings were. He was given to violence and bloodshed. He came back into the region at 663 and defeated Israel. The Old Testament informs us that around this time, Manasseh was taken captive okay, and hauled off um, to, to Nineveh. Second Chronicles, the Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but they paid no attention. Therefore, the Lord brought upon him the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria who captured Manasseh with hooks and bound him with chains of bronze and brought him to Babylon. So in chapter 30, Second Chronicles chapter 33, Manasseh, we'll get to this point, repents. And when he was in distress, this is Manasseh, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to him, and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. So yes, it was probably because Manasseh wasn't saved, but he didn't know that he wasn't saved. But this is one of the most incredible stories in the Old Testament of repentance. Manasseh, an evil, brutal king. Tradition says he sawed Isaiah the prophet in half. And then when he's taken away into Babylon, he comes to his senses. He repents. Now you would think somebody like that, God would say, oh no, no way. Look what you did. Look what you did to my people. Look how you, you prostituted us with, with the Babylonians, with, with the Assyrians. There's no way I'm going to save you. But this is an Old Testament prodigal son. Yes? Manasseh murdered Isaiah. Tradition has it, Manasseh. Sword Isaiah in half. Tradition. It's not biblical. In non-canonical books and in church tradition, Justin Martyr, Origen, uh, and one of the others say that he did. Uh, where do we read of the wickedness of Manasseh in Scripture? Um, those two long passages that I had before. Um, hold on, I'll tell you. Second Kings 21 verses 1 through 17. You'll, you'll get two pages of some pretty horrific stuff that Manasseh has done. We're almost going to finish on time here. So, <clears throat> in some way, the irony is the very worst king that you saw that Israel ever had or Jerusalem ever had was also a beautiful picture of repentance and the extreme graciousness and mercy of God. So where, we see, where we're going to see the justice of God in uh, Nahum coming down on the Assyrians, okay, and, and he's going to, the Ninevites, and give them pure justice, he is also a God of great compassion. But unfortunately, um, since Manasseh sinned the way he did, he couldn't undo the damage that he already done which means that our actions matter. You can choose the sin, but you can't choose the consequence. So there were still consequences for Manasseh's sin. Okay, don't think that you can live a wicked, horrible life and just repent on your deathbed and everything is wiped clean. You would be saved, but the, the effects of your sin will linger on. And that's exactly what we're going to see with, with Manasseh. In 642, Manasseh dies, and he's succeeded by his son Ammon. Um, and then in 640, his son Josiah, who my son is named after, one of the, ki the best kings in Jewish history, he takes the throne. And he took the throne when he was eight years old. Now, here, right here, is where Nahum's prophecy comes in, between Ammon and Josiah. Here's where Nahum is now going to bring this message to the Israelites and tell them that Assyria is going to get it. And although God was the one that used Assyria to punish Israel, the Assyrians' hearts went beyond what God had intended, and they went too far in boasting in their own might. Isaiah says, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger. The staff in their hands is my fury. Against a godless nation I send them, and against the people of my wrath I command them to take the spoil and seize plunder, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. 
but he, do, he, does, he does not so intend as his heart does not so think, but it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. So God uses Assyria to come in to discipline Israel, but their hearts go too far. They want to totally wipe out and destroy Israel, which God is not going to allow. And, this, and it's in this setting that Nahum comes as a prophet with his oracle to Israel. Basically, watch out, Assyria. Here's what's coming. An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in the whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken in pieces by him. This is going to be a great encouragement to the Israelites in Judah to know that Assyria is not going to, is not going to get away with this. Their God, their father, is going to come in and take the Israelites out. It's because of this, the Assyrians' bloodthirstiness, that Nahum gives a blistering, strong, and condemning view of the Assyrians and predicts their collapse. Any questions, Jess? No, uh, it's Hezekiah, Manasseh, and then you have Amnon, Ammon, A-M-O-N, and then Josiah. That's Ammon and Josiah. So that is basically the history behind Assyria, okay, and Israel, how they, the two uh, kind of overlap. You got to remember, really what this is about is the Assyrians coming in. They wipe out the northern tribes of Israel. Now they're, they got their sights set on Judah the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And this is how God is going to preserve his people in the midst of a bloodthirsty nation that wants to take them out. Okay? Remember, Manasseh, the most evil king in all of Israel, repents, and God shows compassion to him. When I was going through that, it just blew me away because it's like this is a guy who deserves hell. And then I realized we all deserve hell. Right? But if you repent, if you change the way you think about your sin and recognize you've sinned against the holy God and you deserve his wrath and you deserve his, his justice, you know what that means. You turn to Jesus, his son, the Savior, the Messiah that would come through Manasseh's line. Right? Okay. No questions? We're good? All right. Next week, we're actually going to get into the text. We're not going to get too far into the text, but we're going to get into the text because it's, it's a lot. There's a lot there. All right, let's close in prayer and get ready for worship.